What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to Fudge Muppet. I'm Scott, and I'm here with Michael and Drew, as always. And today's Elder Scrolls podcast is all about Nocturnal. So, resident daedrologist <laughs> Drew, take it away. I was about to dab, but I don't want that on video. <laughs> Nocturnal is the patron of thieves. She's the queen of night, shadows, and plunging necklines. And uh, she's the prince of darkness, but... I think it's important immediately to distinguish that her darkness is very different to the idea of like the void, you know, Namira's void. Her darkness is like a tool. It's like hiding in the shadows. So that's kind of a mm. distinction between the two. Um, she's very popular, which is a bit ironic given that she's the patron of thieves. But at the same time, if you're going to have shrines to her, they're generally like hidden away or something like that. Um, and yeah, so her like relationship with mortals, I find is very kind of almost transactional it's like she benefits from them they benefit from her they're like associates you know kind of like the nightingales but um yeah that's generally nocturnal and we'll get into detail episode on all of those done. things yeah yeah boys, right, boys you you know. the episode. <laughs> <laughs> actually if i remember correctly in your video on nocturnal you said to understand her is futile because she's about mystery and like it defeats the point to understand her. And then you said, I've been Drew from Fudge Muppet, see you later. <laughs> and then you put like proper 10 seconds of music fade out and then just continued on like normal. <laughs> yeah. Good yeah. Stuff. Where do you go Good from there? Stuff. Yeah. But yeah, for sure. And, and that is one of the most interesting things about Nocturnal, like I just said, is that to understand her kind of defeats the point of her. Mm. Like, she is the mystery. You know what I mean? You're not meant to understand Nocturnal. But in this podcast, we're going to uncover that mystery and uh, make her very upset. Yeah, well, I guess where we can start, like you were bringing up with uh, her being transactional, and she's popular. I mean, there's lots of thieves. So there's lots of people mm. that would benefit from, like, that sort of transactional use of, like, luck or power or, or whatever. Because it's kind of... The power can be vague. It doesn't have to be a sort of like, here's a Daedric artifact or a specific blessing. In the same way that the Thieves Guild in Skyrim was flourishing when Nocturnal's luck was sort of affecting the guild as a whole. Um, but then obviously that went away for reasons we can get into later. But um, a big distinguishing thing it, I, I think is important. Like you were sort of saying with the darkness and void and her not being the literal like nothingness void or so on the darkness it, a way to th sort of think about it too and i wonder if we could kind of connect it to shadow magic but how shadow magic is like um what it's kind of the idea that shadows appear in conflict so you've got like the light and a physical object or something but it's not just in that conflict there's a shadow of all conflict whether that be like wars or even plots and, and, and stuff like that whether she might um so you can kind of expand that sort of shadows into a lot of things in like even like conspiracy sort of stuff. It doesn't have to be just quite literally, you know, shade from the sun kind of thing in, in, in encapsulated within a sphere. And that ties in also to plots that she's uh, gone ahead and with the uh, Clockwork City and the Crystal Tower, which we can go more into. But she... Um, she is not a good person. She is very <laughs> self-interested. She wants what she wants. She doesn't cooperate well with others and, um, or at least she pretends to and then, and then betrays them. But that sort of transactional mindset, some people got, I, I don't know, at least I got the oppression earlier in like Skyrim and stuff. You kind of go like, oh, you know, Azura, as long as we're like good to her and like I'm a nightingale, like, you know, she's good. She's good after all. She won't, but she, she's not, she's like, she, she's very bad. She tried to like, you know, um, rewrite reality with the mm. heart of transparent law and, and then, make it make herself infinite she's very self-involved i mean like that's all daedric princes so you can't be too surprised but i, I guess it's, yeah but it's it, it is the image that she gives out i 100 percent agree it gives yeah. out this very like you don't have to worship me you know i'll just bless you with luck you know respect me um but don't worship me like a traditional daedric prince mm. you know kind of wants worship which is interesting because it makes you wonder about the idea actually of worship and power levels you know how there's this idea that the more worship a Daedric Prince gets, the more power they get. Mm. There's not many people worshipping Nocturnal in the traditional sense, but I suppose the sense that in which they revere her must add to her power because she's extremely powerful. Yeah, yeah, I feel like it's very personal. It's like, a, it's like a thief kind of like quietly praying for some luck before they pull off a job rather than a, you know, a, big, like a big gathering of people 
all praising praising Nocturnal out loud. So it, it's mm. it's much more subtle but still potent. And mm. and there have been there have been examples of her being worshipped. Mm. That there were the the witches in the Purloined Shadows story where her cow gets stolen from her. Um, they're worshipping her and so forth, and she's said to like that. You know, but I think that's because they're kind of um, stroking her ego a bit about how great she is and, you know, dancing around, singing, whatever they do before she loses her cow. Yeah, I think, I mean, we'll talk more about it soon, but I, I think she almost kind of likes people stealing from her in a weird way. It's almost like it's, mm. you know, I think some thieves actually do it as a means of proving themselves to her is to even attempt to steal something from her, <laughs> which, uh, you know, is unusual, but kind of makes sense in a weird way. But I'll just say this now, and, and, and it's kind of goes on to what Scott was saying about her not being nice. But if she wants people to steal from her, it's kind of like that thing like um, Deloths or Dereloth, however you want to pronounce that. The, the girl he brings with him is used as a distraction, right? And Nocturnal catches her and basically like her shadowy like shadows come out and envelop her and kill her or whatever. But the cow still gets the curse put on it. You know, so it's kind of like, oh, if you get caught, I'm going to kill you if you succeed, like, good for you. But instead it was like, oh, you succeeded, but like, haha, I'm going to curse you or I'm going to curse this cow. So there was still a negative aspect to succeeding in stealing from her. Mm. Mm. Well, I, I love the curse of that cow specifically is really cool. Like, I know we're going to talk about the grey cow, but I just love the idea that, you know, like... A lot of, I think a lot of thieves, they want to go down in history as like an incredible burglar or something like that. But specifically <laughs> yeah. this one, it's like, no, you will be the best thief around, but you will never, ever be remembered. You won't be like Rajin, who becomes like a god hero of the Khajiit. You'll just be forgotten. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting too that Nocturnal, in a lot of her actions, she kind of does embody the sort of the thief dynamic because she is... A thief in certain mythologies quite literally like mm. in um khajiit mythology it's implied that the skeleton key once belonged to azura and that nocturnal came along and and she stole that mm. and, and ran away and took it off back into the void mm. and like it's just and then also i mean all of the kind of backstabbing and stealing she does with the triad like do you want to let's i'll bring that up let's talk about what exactly she did so in the second era this is the eso um uh, events um, of the Morrowind expansion. Sorry, the Clockwork City. It's kind of connected to the Morrowind D DLC as well, but it feeds into the Clockwork City and then into the Somerset Isles. It's sort of like a continuing sort of storyline that there's a triad of Nocturnal, Clavicus Violent, Mafala, and they decided to get together and they're going to hatch a little master plan here. And then, so Nocturnal uh, creates a shadow of of Sotha Sill and and manipulates things and tries to get the gets her hands on the skeleton key. Um and using or using all of that, the, it was basically she's trying to get to um ultimately this plot she ends up betraying Clavicus Vile and Mephila, which in the Somerset Isle stuff, and she's using the secret she stole from Sotha Sill. This is from memory, so hold on. The secret she stole from Sotha Sill, and she's going to use that to affect the heart of transparent law, which is the heart of the Crystal Tower. And she wants to use that to reshape reality and make herself an infinite being. Um, and then obviously, she, you know, she, she betrays Mephala and Clavicus Vile to do that. And then you sort of help Mephala a bit and Clavicus Vile to sort of get back at her and stop her. And obviously it doesn't happen. But Nocturnal's intention there is completely self-involved through everyone else under the rug and she just wants to create to make herself infinite and everything I mean, well for first thing i think it's hilarious that of all the daedric princes to a lion you've yeah. got dodgy deals you've got like the the mother of betrayal and assassination all of this stuff and then nocturnal and nocturnal's the one who screws them over as well but um there's mm. a quote from sofa sill that says Imagine a Daedric prince who can exert influence throughout the multiverse at the exact same moment in time. Nocturnal could become infinite. So my interpretation of that was it's almost like she wants to become more than just Daedra. It's like she wants to have influence in Aetherius as well, like to break out from Oblivion and kind of become such a an infinite being that she's almost like as Aedric as she is Daedric. But it's kind of, it's a weird area to try and broach. It's kind of like a kind of weird not not uh 
Kim kind of thing, but it kind of seems like a Amore, like becoming infinite, but like consuming mm. everything within the Godhead kind of kind of mm. thing going on. And no, no wonder she failed. I mean, making the deal with Clav Kaspar, <laughs> what can you expect? Of course, he's going to get the player character involved and, and it's not all going to happen. Yeah. Player character's um, OP, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's a good story, but I, I do like how it expands on her a bit more and makes her less of a... Um, just, oh, I'm a thief god, but she's way more malevolent. I, I don't think she's a... I, mm. I wouldn't worship her. Well, I think... Yeah, it's yeah. the same as Meridia. Like, yeah. people tend to see Meridia as one of those Daedric mm. princes that are, oh, they're one of the nice ones. And it's like, no, nah, they're really not. Yeah. I think ESO did a great job with Nocturnal because, um, especially in the Khajiit myths, is that you really do flesh her out. So, you know, you've got the idea that she's born from the black blood of Lorcage at the steps of the Void Gate. So even though we've said, you know, she's not kind of, she's not the great darkness like Namira, you know, because shadows, you can't have shadows in just pure darkness, but she's yeah. still made from darkness. She's kind of a meshing of the two. So there is the, the kind of malevolent side of her, the, the one that can't be trusted. So she's not all good, you know, mm. it's cool. But then she does have an interesting relationship with the thieves still. Like at least Carlyle describes her as more like a, like a tough mother who cares about her kids type thing. Mm. So you do get, yeah, you get both. You know, you get elements of the light and the dark, I guess. Well, we can kind of talk about that a bit more too. We could kind of go into the, the nightingales and um, and and the, their purpose and everything, which can then, we can then segue further. So I guess the nightingales are basically uh, th thieves who have entered a pact with Nocturnal to basically forever and eternally guard the gate um the what is it called the ebonmere which is the gate to the Evergloom. so you yeah. can get get in there and, and they're also supposed to guard the skeleton key as well um and even in death they'll they'll remain as nightingales guarding that so that there's a little uh little interesting pact there but it's very i feel like it favors nocturnal more i mean look the thieves get some luck and they get there to go and like you know steal heaps of riches and stuff like that but i don't know to me that sounds like a kind of a bad deal mm. because then i just have to be stuck in the twilight sepulchre or whatever it was called and then mm. be a, like a ghost nightingale guarding it for all of time yeah because you're when the nightingale dies right and goes to the realm mm. doesn't there kind of thiefy essence become part of the or like a crew into the luck and the shadows that like kind of leak out and help other thieves. Yeah, yeah. In essence, the idea is that they can can kind of bestow luck onto other other thieves further down the line. But it it, it does like yeah. It, it seems counterintuitive for a thief to want to sign up for a lifelong pact and an what an eternity long pact because thieves at at the very core are selfish. You know, it's like you yeah. make a deal, but you do it because you want something in return. You know, I feel like it'd be much easier to just get a job <laughs> instead of being a thief. Like, there's a hot take. It's so like, easy just to chop wood at your nearest farm. All you do is yeah, press well, A. I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least you might go to some form of heaven or whatever, or, or you could pursue some other, you know. But but not all thieves have to become nightingales. No, no. I just mean the ones that the ones that do. I mean, the there's only three sick. at any given time, right? Yeah, the it's like a trio. Yeah, yeah, and and they get the you know the agent the agent of of stealth chaos and subterfuge mm. yeah i guess you know, to be they fair. get different powers it's like a superhero game yeah and then you've got nocturnal who's got all her different titles which all sound like superhero but it's only names. a superhero like the, game because it's got a cape and it's a cool <laughs> the set mistress of, of mystery but you do kind of get immortalized that. as like a great thief if you become a nightingale it's like the opposite of if you achieve it with the cow you know there's yeah you're so you know you you give your eternity to nocturnal but eternally you're uh, an amazing thief to be fair though i'm pretty sure a lot of thieves they don't even know about the nightingales they're almost like not real to the mm. common thief or like your real common member of the thieves guild you know and then like they could be used as like a as like a scary tactic as like oh do what we say or you know you'll have the nightingales to deal with but i feel like a lot of the time it's just they're not really given much attention mm yeah, yeah. <laughs> i guess that is the say, deal it, it does with... seem like a bad deal it seems like a bad yeah, deal to yeah. me uh, that is the deal with nocturnal and thieves i guess is that it's you know it's in the shadows it's not like 
really out there and everyone knows about it so you know just like how nocturnal isn't really worshipped that much in public mm -hmm. if you become a nightingale you yeah maybe i'm wrong maybe you just get forgotten it's all what, <laughs> what about what about yeager than because he was said to be a nightingale so he's not that so originally in arena law he was called a nightingale so on i mean he was supposedly that nightingale that basically uh seduces baron zyra and knocks her up but more current law is it was Draven, I think it's Draven Inderil, who was yeah. doing it for Jagarthan. Um, so he, um, and then he knocked up Baron Zyra, and then that's why generations down you've got Carlyle being descended mm. from Baron Zyra. And that was like to do with the arena plot because he was getting the business staff of chaos or something. Mm. But um, since we're on the topic of Nightingales anyway, and they're, they're guarding the Ebonmere, which is the portal to um, the Evergloom. Let's uh, let's talk about the Evergloom. Okay. Well, I know the portal, at least, you need the skeleton key to kind of, like, keep open, and that also keeps the luck flowing out. Mm. That, uh, that, it, that is why the Thieves' Guild had bad luck. Yeah. Because the key was taken. Do we even have... Is there even a description of the Evergloom? Because there's more, I feel like there's more on the um, the pocket realms of the Evergloom than there actually is on the Evergloom. I mean, the Evergloom oh, itself, there's a perpetual there's... twilight. Mm. That's pretty cool. But still, there's nothing much going on on it. Because I think we've only ever seen there's this place called the Shadow Cleft. Yeah, which is like described Look, as a bit of the shadow realm. but let's talk about the other ones there's evergloom big shadow realm and th there's things from there right yeah so like, there's different pocket realms so sh you've got shade perilous and crow's wood crow's wood is the one that is has a bit of meme value at least to me because mm. it's filled with talking crows see i really like this so the crow's wood then it has the black feather court which is it is led by the Duke of Crows and it, and they all of these sort of... They're, they're like Daedra crows, but I like how there's actually like a living place for the crows that are seen with Nocturnal and associated with her. So they are like these sort of sentient beings. It, it gives me similar vibes to, um, you know, Odin, even his depictions with the, the ravens and so on that, that, like, that are like... I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan that, of ravens. That are seeing. So, so I just kind of like that it gives them a bit of a personality because... It's very easy to look at all of these Daedra with their, like, minions and see them as very disconnected. It's like, oh, this is just the enemy they send out. But it's the same as we see with, you know, Shea Gorath and his, um, you know, certain Daedra and so on. They're kind of inbuilt into the to the civilization of the Shivering Isles in the same way that here, that even the crows have sort of have, like, a sentience and, and mm. are built into this sort of little civil and there's some society. So I was going to say there's some cool crow-based creatures as well, like a wraith of crows. It's kind of like, it's hard to describe, but it's almost like a hag raven, but a crow being used as the bird. Mm. And then the, fa the face looks different. The face is like a crow's basically head with a big beak. But I think a wraith of crows is a really, really cool kind of Daedric crow-like entity. See, I hate the wraith of crows because... Really? Uh, I mean, you might remember this. This is uh, very anecdotal, but we, we were in the office trying to get... Oh, well, I was trying to get all the footage for the Clockwork City video, and I fought against the Ray for Crows, and I'm fairly sure you were, like, watching over my shoulder as I did it. I killed the thing, and then the game just completely bugged out. There was no I way to know. advance the quest line. I just remember you calling me over every time I had a, bo you no, had a boss to this kill and couldn't time. do it, and I was like, all right, and then I'd just get it. Okay, no, time. so with that, it was fighting <laughs> against the shadow of Sofa Sil, and I was mm. way under-leveled because I was just grinding through it to get to the end of the DLC. And then you're like, all right, let me have a go, let me have a go. And the second you take the control, some like level 90 dude rolls in and one shots it and you're like boom easy boys easy <laughs> that's not what happened it's pretty much what I, happened. I took off half the health before he got there you were there just firing at the same time as this level I, 90 no, guy no 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 the reason is because I just figure out how to cheese it I don't try and do it legitimately yeah you just make but like anyway. really powerful friends <laughs> <laughs> All right, nerds, let's, <laughs> let, let's, let's, um, so we were just talking about uh, that. Let's talk about the, so there's the crows and the crow daedra, right? Let's talk about the nocturnal shrikes, which in previous games have just been referred to as lesser or greater nocturnals, but nocturnal shrikes to distinguish them more. 
are these sort of uh, these daydru women. They basically look like topless women or they put like a little bikini thing on or they're wearing hair over their tits like you know um and i do like they've been described with um like beautiful voices and stuff as well like singing i forget which book it was but there was a there's a book that sort of mentioned that they just have like these sort of like beautiful voices and stuff as well but yeah so they're scantily clad tall beautiful women that are actually um quite powerful and um I like the little ad that, like, though, prone to bouts of deba um, debilitating melancholy. And that's kind of like a... I don't know. I, it just feels very on theme for Nocturnal. Like, and I can imagine, them, like, just all of a sudden just get hit with a wave of depression. And then yeah. <laughs> just, like, the depressing danger in the shadows. It's, like, very emo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. What, what other um, entities does she have? I know the Maz can have have served her before. Yeah, but they've served plenty. Like, I, yeah, I think I think I think it's outside the ones that are kind of her signature ones are the nocturnal shrikes and the um mm. and the crows. But mm. yeah, they they are they are an interesting bunch. But I don't know if there's all too much to say. There there is I think a a, a les I think it's I think this is the one where there's a lesbian relationship. I've seen one of the earliest examples of an LGBT thing in Elder Scrolls. And um, it's, I think it's the J.C. or Morgan chick who was in a relationship with. Yeah, one of her there apprentices, was, another, was it? Or? Yeah, it, was so, it was something like that. I can't, I can't actually remember. So she, because she went into a melon, during the events of Battlespire, I'm trying to remember it without getting anything wrong, but Mayrin's Dagon's hordes essentially screwed screwed them over she went into a melancholy so she wasn't really doing anything to protect her pocket realm and then her apprentice essentially tries to get her to wake up from this so the only way to do it was to sacrifice herself so that she snapped out of it and actually fought yeah. for her realm so that's kind of you know that's pretty sweet yeah. and it's also mm. was it sorry go michael you go. oh i was gonna say there's more creatures than the ones we talked about there's mm. the gloam knights who look incredibly creepy, nicknamed oh, the Shadow of Nocturnal. And there's also the Grievous Twilights, which are like massive winged kind of beasts. Although they often serve Molag Bow. So I think the Gloam Knight is a probably highly the, specific. Yeah, because isn't it something... Um, I just want to look at it because I can't remember. If from memory, it was something like a... Uh, isn't it like a deceased... Yeah, like her Something servants like or uh, worshippers can become gloam knights in the Evergloam, I think. They're wraith-like creatures incapable of feeling sympathy, embodiments of hate and mystery. Hmm. They can have two to six arms. See, I, I just, this is sort of like, kind of like the redeem, thinking about the redeeming things of Nocturnal. Well, sorry, the lack of redeeming things. Like, she's a thief and stuff, but then it's like, oh, here's her Gloam Nine's embodiments of hate and mystery. And here's. Yeah, and, and it's a follower of hers. Like, yeah. sorry, Nocturnal may transform her followers into Gloam Knights upon their death. So. Yeah, yeah I the don't hate know. thing seems, you know, especially because it's ESO that's building her up to be slightly more, you know, complex. So, so, you know, the idea that they're the embodiment of hate seems a bit, I don't know, doesn't seem fitting. But there you go. I wouldn't want to become one, personally. No. Imagine being a thief and you serve Nocturnal <laughs> and you become a Gloam Knight. Yeah, I, I don't know if I, if I vibe that. But let's start talking then about her artifacts because that's some of the most i think that's what really makes a lot of people besides her double d's i think <laughs> i think it's really is the artifacts that make her so interesting to a mm. lot of people 100 percent, 100 percent. so there's the gray cowl of nocturnal mm -hmm. which in oblivion looks kind of hilarious on the gray fox like as a kid when i played oblivion and i met the gray fox for the first time i was like oh my gosh this is the coolest thing i want to wear that mask that's the best now <laughs> a, funny, 
I was just gonna say a funny story about that because you first it's in it's in a broomer house I think is the first yeah time you meet I, him in the yeah in the, like, I went bottom down. level I feel like I can remember, even remember my like cognitive dissonance like in my head I was like oh this kind of looks shitty but then I'm like oh no that's no, so cool it's the great fox <laughs> no this is cool this is cool and I'm like swept up in the like awe of it but I'm like kind of at the back of my mind still like Oh, it looks a little different than I thought. Like, it looks a little different than it does on the posters. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. it's just... It it looks a lot better um, when you go to Mercer Frey's place in Skyrim and you find the bust. Mm. It just looks like it's stylized a little bit more. You know, it looks a little bit more like something Batman could wear and a bit less like a, I don't know, a grey leather condom, basically. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, it's yeah. true, but with yeah. a Daedric down the middle. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so this was basically Nocturnal's cowl. I can't imagine Nocturnal wearing it. It would look kind of funny. Um, but yeah, so Gip basically mask. it says, yeah, <laughs> it says Shadow Hide You um, in the Daedric text down the middle, which is something that the thieves in the Thieves Guild especially say to each other, sometimes out of reverence for Nocturnal, or sometimes as kind of just like a, you know, literally shadows hide you, good luck thieving type thing. Um, The interesting thing about the mask, as we were kind of saying at the start, is that it strikes your name from history. So, or at least it did before the curse was removed with an Elder Scroll that was stolen during the events of Oblivion. So the original curse is basically that no one knows who you are once you put on the mask your identity is destroyed you are the gray fox this immortal figurehead super thief you know hated by the imperial watch and the no nobility loved by thieves and beggars but who you are ceases to be and kind of history is rewritten so that you never existed the memories of you in the minds of others are gone and it kind of seems to be a thing that applies even if you kind of like from the second you wear it, because you know how the gray fox took it off, and then he's still like the um, what's it called? It? He's he's at the the forger he's guy the in Anvil as well. Like he was that the guy the the stranger or whatever the guy. Oh, forging. sorry, that forger. I thought you were talking about the blacksmith dude in the no, castle. No, 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 no. I was like, what? Yeah, the stranger you meet. Yeah. Right? So stranger. even without it, he's still even if he took it off and he's like, no, no, it's me. It, it still doesn't work because the curse is kind of on you when you've put mm-hmm. it on. Yeah, so his name just becomes a stranger. Mm. It changes later to the stranger. Little Easter egg for you, but <laughs> yeah, a little bit of little bit of knowledge you didn't know. Um, but yeah, so that's Corvus Umbranox. Mm. So he was the Count of Anvil, and the Countess is alone, and he has stood before her without the mask on and said, "It's me, Corvus." And she just kind of looked at him confused or didn't. She just really left him on scene. Him. Yeah, she just <laughs> she didn't get it at all. Um, until you go and steal an Elder Scroll, which is one of the best missions in any Elder Scrolls game, right? The ultimate heist. And you rewrite history so that the cow never had this curse and the Thieves Guild flourished because of that. And then you eventually get made the Grey Fox and you can wear the cow, but it doesn't strike your identity. So when you're not wearing it, um, you're just you. But when you are wearing it, it still retains the benefits. You're still the gray fox. You can, it's like playing peekaboo with a child, with the guards. You can just put put it on. They'll yeah. come to arrest you. You just whip it off really quick and they'll just get confused. So you can basically accrue any bounty or infamy you want to the gray fox. You can do anything you want. You could walk up to someone, put them, have the mask on, kill them and take the mask off. And you would be completely fine. And one of the cool things about it is you got to think like compared to other Daedric artifacts, they don't hide your identity. So if you got some godlike powers, you could still be killed. Whereas with the cow, you you do get um, super thieving and like stealth abilities and stuff, which is cool. But you could just kill someone conventionally and take the cow off. And you're not going to ever be hunted down because no one knows who you are. Yeah, I, I do. I really do like that it, it, unique in the fact that it kind of creates like a transient sort of identity for the gray fox so that the gray fox can be this sort of figure that, you know, some people might like, oh, is this a, this immortal gray fox because they've been around for so long or, or, or stuff like that. But rather it is just multiple wearers of the, of the mask that have become the gray fox. I, I just li- I, I like those sort of things that 
it takes on an identity of itself, you know? Mm hmm. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit 100%. of a cope, but it's like I've kind of like in my. No, no, no. What I'm about to say is a cope. It's like a, I've, kind of, I've kind of headcanoned why it looks so crap as basically it's like it's all part of the curse. It's like there's no way it looked like that on the back of Nocturnal's hood, but when it gets cut off and cursed, it's like, no, not only will you be forgotten, but you're going to look like a gimp as you do it. It's like, <laughs> it's like you're, it, it, it is forgettable to look at. It's, it's kind of a bit silly. It's not like, imagine if it was some really awesome looking uh, cow that, that would fit on Nocturnal's cloak. It's like, they're going to be very memorable. Where it's like, yeah, you, you have to be forgotten and look shit. Well, that's the, the weird. That's the weird thing is that the cow's not invisible, right? So when you rip it off your head, wouldn't you still be holding it in your hand? And people would just look at you and be like, what's this? What yeah, you but these are it? oblivion guards. Weird. They're not the cleverest. I don't know, man. They seem to have telepathy and know that I just moved, not even stole, moved a cheese wedge a few districts <laughs> over. And I get a five-star GTA rating and, and they, all, they all head on over, you know? Yeah, fair. But yeah, the, the cow is super, super cool. And as we were saying, there's a story... Uh, about how it was stolen by the first guild master of the thieves guild uh which is pronounced many ways i've always <laughs> said like emma derloth like emma derloth some people mm. say emma derloth that's how i would uh, but yeah. yeah emma yeah <laughs> anyway well emma so, yeah. whatever not emma yeah. <laughs> like emma uh was so so the cow was stolen and he basically used uh, another thief as a distraction to steal it when there were the witches mm. and they made kind of nocturnal come out and then basically they all point up and go oh there's the girl and then she realizes she was the distraction and the cow gets taken to be fair she actually kind of gets a lot of stuff stolen from her yeah like the, 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 the whole eye of nocturnal mm. thing so like the quest in oblivion the, where you where these mm -hmm. two argonians have stolen the eye of nocturnal and then hid it in this sort of like little cave basement thing um, what is this artifact anyway? I've never understood what it is. I think Maybe it's just like a scrying stone of sorts. Well, I don't know. It's just. But remember, she can see where it is, and that's why it's hidden in the cave. She can see it's through it. Literally, the just eye. her eye. It could kind of be. But that would also fit with a scrying thing that she's. Yeah, I guess. So. I find it so funny to imagine the people stealing it because, like, say they're just holding it, and Nocturnal can just see like up their chin as they're running away <laughs> with it. It's like when you oh, if you see like a live stream where someone steals a phone from a live yeah, streamer. Yeah, 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 like, yeah. Oh, <laughs> Cameras up their face. Yeah. That's what nocturnal scene. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but um, yeah. So and it, but in Oblivion, you get the skeleton key in return for that. You actually get the skeleton key pretty easy in Skyrim. They really mm -hmm. like buff it up. They're like, whoa, this is this is it needs super protection. This is crazy. This is... and you don't even get to keep it. Yeah, and unless it... you don't want to finish the storyline. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas in Oblivion you get it real quick. It was it it becomes a thing that you do really quickly as soon as you can do it because yeah. you never have to invest into the security skill. Yeah, level you just get 10. this unbreakable lock pick, right? That buffs up your security skill, but then you just press auto attempt as many times as you yeah. can and it just goes and then unlocks whatever you want. Yeah. And I like how in in that's in that incarnation of it, it looks like a like a mechanical lock pick. That you can imagine some really old school, almost steampunk tech vibes where it like goes and like yeah. picks a lock when you stick it in and maybe press a button. Whereas in other examples, it's kind of literally like a key that will open any any yeah. door. So so do we want to talk about the skeleton key? Do we have anything else to say about the grey cow? I don't think so. I think it's sort of done. And I think we talked about it a decent bit in the Daedric Artifacts yeah. podcast. So... Um, okay, so there's the skeleton yeah. key. So the skeleton key itself um, can open any physical thing, but also has the potential to unlock your own potential, right? So you can unlock yourself with it. Mm. So this is not just speculation, by the way. The source for this is Carlyle. In Skyrim, she explains yeah. that it has the potential to unlock your potential, as I was saying. But where would you put and it to unlock your potential? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I feel like just straight into your chest or something would be the most cool no slash appropriate. There. Yeah, it's got to be somewhere with a hole. And it's got to be one that anyone can have as well. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm Ma not sure. Your mouth. Oh, you, you put the skeleton course. key in your yeah. mouth. Yeah. Okay. But then you can't speak. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you, you just do it. You put it in your mouth, twist it, and take it out, and you're unlocked. 
but but seriously it doesn't have to fit because (laughs) (laughs) just to let that joke fly (laughs) over my head every door you come across like actual physical doors they're not all going to be um have the same size lock or whatever it kind of i imagine just magically yeah, it adapts to the I size of the orifice th- regardless like so <laughs> the, the um, keyhole yeah. is what i meant but I, I i genuinely kind of believe that like i feel like it just kind of it's cool to imagine like if you took the skyrim one like the bottom end of it's the same but the key actually shapes to whatever it's going into as it does and hmm. you know. like magically just kind of yeah. goes into the shape of the lock and then you twist it and it unlocks yeah. at least that's that's what i imagine but that explains everyone mm. Back on topic. I am. Why Mercer Frey yeah. was so powerful, right? Mm. And he <laughs> he even uses it. There's there's this scene. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Boys, there's this scene in the blindsided quest, right? Like when you're going through all those kind of like the Dwemer ruin and there's heaps of Falma who are really annoying. Mm. Uh, a, a tower basically like collapses, right? Mm. And Brynjolf's like, whoa, like, how did that happen? And Carlyle basically says, like, Mercer Frey did it, slash has the potential to do things like that because of the skeleton key, and there's no telling what he's capable of with that artifact in his hands. So to me, it kind of has the idea that you can become, if you're a novice wizard, you could become a grand wizard, or if, if you're a beginner archer, you could reach, like, Legolas level heights, so long as you have the skeleton key in your possession, which is like one in a million chance, and then know how to use it to unlock all this stuff, which is also one in a million chance probably. Yeah. So it's very unlikely that the power of the key actually gets harnessed. Um, and I feel like though, those that actually get their hands on it will tend to be people who could harness its potential. Although not in the case of Oblivion, where you got it just for going and getting that eye. So for for its origin story, what do you guys think? Do you think created by Nocturnal or do you think stolen from Azura as is in the Khajiiti well, myths? When you read the Khajiiti story, it talks about, I believe it's Boethia defeating Nocturnal mm-hmm. and then bringing her before Azura to be judged. Mm-hmm. And Azura basically says, you can serve me and live or not. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then Azura, uh, sorry, and then Nocturnal seeing a moment of opportunity goes and steals i think it's one of azura's keys yeah and then use and then escapes back into like the void right yeah so, so it's, it's not necessarily the skeleton key but it's kind at of least like it's, it's kind heavily of insinuated impl- i think yeah yeah kind of well at just by I think we want to believe that well, I yeah, just, nocturnal has a key where'd she get it yeah yeah and and associated with um, mm. yeah. Plus the law but, ramifications are way cooler with Well, that's that kind origin. of why I like to believe the Khajiit myth one, just because I feel like, A, it's very on brand for Nocturnal, like, you know, patron of thieves to, to steal the, the key. Mm. Um, and Well, she did steal a key and it could almost be mm. seen as that's how she escaped. So, it, mm. so if it is the skeleton key, this also brings in the idea that the skeleton key cannot just open physical barriers or unlock your own potential, as Carl Iyer explains in the Thieves' Guild story, but actually unlock portals to different realms and other places of power or danger. Well, that's all um, we- So long as you know how to go there, based on two things. A, the fact that it at least sounds like in that Khajiit story that it was used for her to unlock whatever portal to escape from Azura. Mm. And, and secondly, um, that it kind of opens the portal to the um evangloom yeah yeah so my interpretation of this sorry evergloom yeah. i get it so confused evergloom ebon they're like so mixed together you know you've got um in the khajiit creation myth you've got azura is responsible for creating the lunar lattice which is the barrier between oblivion and the mortal realm of mundus so Having the skeleton key, it's, you know, it not only would kind of explain how Nocturnal can open portals between Oblivion and the mortal realm to her own realm, but it's a way of, like, essentially the skeleton key's potential is that, like opening any door in the real world, it can open gates to every realm of Oblivion. And I think, I don't think it has the power to yet, but it has the potential to possibly open into a furious and that's kind of what she wants to realize i mean she tried to realize that with mm. so Sil's artifact but failed and i think that's mm. kind of she's just trying to unlock everything you know yeah she's imagine, a hacker. If that, imagine if that's actually a bit more of a motivation is kind of like a thief 
it's kind of, if you could imagine a thief's sort of obsession, like an ambitious thief that's sort of like, oh, I want to be able to get into anything and unlock anything. That might even be a bit of nocturnal sort of psyche. It's like, I want to unlock everything, do everything, get everywhere, have she my like access. Yeah, like access. as much access as she can get. I mean, yeah, Ethereus is like the ultimate master lock, you know, to, to, yeah. to access as well. You yeah, know, it's so, what the Daedra have been kind of pushed out from. They're not a part of it. Um, you know, she can access the mortal realm. I think she can probably access a lot of oblivion with it, with its potential. But like the ultimate lock is the the Adric yeah. realm. Yeah, I, I think it's very on brand the the Khajiit sort of the, the Khajiit myth. I, that's what that's what I buy into. I think it's a mu it's much more interesting than oh she just created it. And yeah, especially I mean, a, a lot of the Khajiit myths are really cool. Like in general. Yeah, yeah, that, that's one of the most like well thought out mythologies they've added for sure. Oh. I hope that I inspired that when I made that video and I was like, why uh, elsewhere would be a bad location for yeah. Elder Scrolls 6. I still kind of stand by it for it, from an Elder Scrolls 6 uh, perspective, uh, but I really didn't think Bethesda would ever be, uh, Zenimax or whoever would ever be bothered to put all the different um, breeds in. And then they did. And I'm like, I hope I like put this energy in you of like, you can't do it. And they want to prove me wrong. <laughs> yeah. We should go back to that and comment like this aged poorly. <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> but can you see it being done in Elder Scrolls Six? Oh, well, I, I, or, or, I, I could, as in like they... elsewhere being the location. I'm, I mean, not realistically. Yeah. We know it's not yeah. going to be, but I mean, like, could you see them doing a brand new Elder Scrolls game in elsewhere that fulfills all of the lore about elsewhere really well? I, I, I don't know. I just know that, like, because early years, so you can, you know, examples with like not putting the Imga in Valenwood and stuff. That's exactly, I mean, that's exactly why I made the video. Yeah. Were, it's like, a, like, look, Elder Scrolls Online has some great stuff, but especially at the start, there was some really, really lazy and stuff. And you can see where they cut corners in some of those areas because they didn't want to, and, and, you know, to a degree, fair enough, you're building this huge thing. You can't allocate heaps of time to every little detail or bit. Like how much is it just to put in, you know, some monkeys and, and Imga or whatnot. But, um, yeah, it was really good that they did do it for uh, elsewhere. Well, that's the thing. The expansions are focused, you know, whereas yeah. um, all, all of all of the really bad stuff about ESO was when they just shoved the whole of Tamriel at you. You know, mm -hmm. whereas when they focus, maybe not so much Morrowind, but when they focused on Merkmire and focused on elsewhere, it really delivered. Um, but yeah, yeah it, it did seem a bit rushed when it was the whole thing. Hmm. So I, I guess we can talk about, oh, her craziest Daedric artifact of <laughs> the all. The Bow of Shadows. <laughs> yeah. The Bow of Shadows is basically just a powerful bow that makes you really fast and invisible. So, that's cool. It's I cool. don't know if there's any special does, metaphysical um, uses remember, for it, it. Does Dram... Is it? Yeah. Yeah, he has it. It is reported, reported that the assassin Dram once wielded it. Yeah. but the uh, In the Battle of Hunding Bay when he shot Prince Ator with the poisoned arrow that eventually killed him. Yeah. Um, it's not that cool. I mean, it's cool. Come it's, on. Like, people get the Nightingale bow or the Nightingale sword from Skyrim and think that's cool. The Bow of Shadows is cooler than the Nightingale oh, bow. Oh, sure. The Nightingale sword has a cool design. But, like, the Nightingale... Oh, they all have cool designs. The problem Even the with Nightingale the... arm uh, is cool because you're a superhero-looking dude. The problem you're with right. the Bow of Shadows, though, is, like, if you're playing a nocturnal worshipping stealthy character, why would you ever want a bow? You know, like, who plays a stealth archer? Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, like... Put a rope onto well, it and shoot an arrow and use it as a grappling hook. A lot of assassins, in theory, could actually worship Nocturnal and gain a lot of benefit. But they do just tend to worship other more violent Daedric Princes, typically. You know, they like their Sithis, they like their Mephala and things like that. Um, but you could. There's no reason why you couldn't, right? Yeah. Uh, I hardly absolutely. doubt Nocturnal would be against killing or maybe she <clears throat> pretends to be i don't know but she definitely it's not it's not a um it's not below her yeah i just uh yeah i i think it's not a good idea pretty much in any circumstance <laughs> to really get into look maybe if you're a thief or something but then i guess my argument would be don't be a thief don't worship nocturnal i think is she... there is there any um we should probably make a video don't worship her part two. Don't but simp it's about for her. Nocturnal. Yeah. Because, yeah. <laughs> like, honestly, she's not... She is not what she's... Uh, I don't know. She, she, she's a bad, bad person. 
<laughs> I just don't like her. I think she's one of the people like her because she's got cleavage. And she's got cool artifacts. But oh, like, I like Nocturnal from a law perspective. Oh, yeah. From the law's cool. I don't, do I'm not... you like any Daedra from a they're a nice person perspective? Yeah. See, there are, there are some. Like, you know, her scene. I was, I was wondering maybe we should make a video on this. But, like, the, the most morally, like, good, I could say, like, Daedra are some of the more, like, consistent ones. Like, so, like, her scene is, is very... He, he's, like, honourable in fair. that sense. And he's, he, is he's he, though? Fair. Well, he respects the competition above anything. But then let again, me, he does Let stack. me tell you a little story about Thane Icehammer, a Nord hunter hmm. who unknowingly killed a bunch yeah. of were creatures. Her scene, in my opinion, should find that impressive. He's... Instead, he gets angry and shoves the spear of bitter mercy in his side. The spear tip breaks off and stays inside yeah. where it corrupts Thane Icehammer, turns him crazy... Well, he kills mm. an acolyte of kind in a fit of rage, gets buried alive in some tombs and becomes a drago walking its halls until he's killed in the second era. Two That's things. That's not fair. To be, <laughs> that is not but fair to, and just. But to be fair, he was protecting his own creatures. And the second thing is, he is still a Daedra. As far as Daedra go. Th That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, they're but, all but Daedra. Her, but her scene, like, outside, like, you know... No one's nobody's perfect, Mark. But, uh, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know what I mean. But like, for the most it, part, her scene is a pretty straightforward, good Daedric prince that has been is pretty fair most of the time. Plus, her but scene doesn't what, miss. If he hit him in the side, it was probably like, a, "Hey, you stop that!" But I'm not going to kill you. <laughs> and then the the spear does its thing, and he's like, oh, yeah. "Oops," <laughs> you know. So I reckon he was. You know being what nice. I mean, though. He. He, in, based on how he acted in Skyrim, I would expect him to almost be super impressed because he's meant to respect the hunter as well as the hunted, regardless of if they're a lycanthrope or not. But anyway, we won't, we won't uh, go too far into her scene in this mm. podcast. We can save it for another one. I yeah. do agree with you generally. But yes. I'm probably just being that person who I usually don't like. Like, here's one example of why you're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but, but like, it is cool. But that's Elder Scrolls lore. But in essence, I think the, the point of bringing that up anyway is just like Nocturnal is like the opposite example of that. I think there's just too many examples of just kind of like even the business transactions just seem kind of unfair. Like the whole Nightingale scenario. Like, I wouldn't take that. Or maybe they deem it fair, but I just. And there's just lots of. Devi I mean, she literally tried to make the entire world her, so I don't really... In in Skyrim as well, don't you swear, because you haven't got the skeleton key yet, don't you kind of swear allegiance to her forever and everything, but you kind of a pseudo-nightingale because you haven't gone and been blessed and well, got one of those agent powers and anything? I don't know. It, it's, the, it's the joke, too, that like you, you the Dragonborn belongs to like 15 <laughs> Dietrich princes. No, but what I'm saying is it's like you served you... Um, gave your kind of devotion up front. Like you paid in advance. You didn't get your Nightingale powers until you swore loyalty to her and then helped her. You know, like you'd think, yeah. oh, I'm a Nightingale now. All right, I'm going to swap this. Here's my soul. Give me some juicy powers. But instead, here's yeah. my soul, but like no powers for me until I help you. Yeah. It sounds rough. I'm not, I'm, yeah. She's look, just For a lot of people, it's just getting a bit of luck. You know, it's not like you're not giving everything to her and yeah. she's not taking everything yeah. from you. I think as far as worshipping princes go, she's one of the better ones, in my opinion. You know, so oh, long as you don't end up being a, um, what do you call it, a gloam knight or a, yeah, yeah. or like I wouldn't want <laughs> I to be a nightingale. On a, on a casual level, but like, I mean, you could even argue, like, even if you were to compare, like, okay, Mary, this is a funny one because Mayrin's Dagon is like, you know, the most like typical looking evil kind of thing. But even his like, ideas of like revolution and, and change and, and destruction are kind of like consistent and not necessarily like this sort of e he's like kind of acting out his sphere versus egotistically looking after their own things kind of it's like at least you know what you're getting into when you sign up <laughs> with Dagon. Yeah. but i mean like you, you can are as there well would be a lot of nocturnal it's just whether not, or not though. well no but that that like the fact Do you that think some thief knows that they might be made into a gloam knight? That, that, that she may essentially steal you or steal your soul. I feel like that, it, it's at very least, is consistent of what to expect from her. Whether or not it's good is another question. But yeah, well, that's what I'm kind of saying, is what I'm saying is like, that sounds sucky. <laughs> I just, oh, one day she just whimsically just decides to steal your soul. Or yeah, but whatever. have you seen her? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yeah, Have no, you I, seen I, those I tits, dude? <laughs> but, but yeah. Being a Nightingale I, is just being like the number one patron or OnlyFans supporter. Yeah. <laughs> Let's, let's um, I, I was gonna I, I did ask her some questions on YouTube and we can kind of so from Maeve SW, what relationships does she have with the other Daedric princes, if any? She seems different than most of our pals from Oblivion. Any ideas why? Well, she does have interactions with Mephala and Clavicus Vile as a little triad, like little little conspiracy to get hold of the Crystal Tower. But um, we talked about that. But outside of that, I don't know if there is too much, but maybe if she, you know, stole potentially in Khajiit Myth, she stole the, the key from Azura. But one, just saying so she seems different, and there, some people kind of point that out, and we can kind of talk about the term Ur, Urdra or Ur, Urdaedra, because um, like Ur in English to be like, it's like the most primal or original kind of thing, and Urdra just seems like a sort of combined Urdaedra, because Urdaedra is specifically used um, about Hermaeus Mora, and I think there's the Urdra is used in the Khajiit um, writings and it refers to like um azura and namira, namira yeah. as well but sort of seemingly some of the most like you know the most ancient original kind of oldest spirits potentially and there are ideas that she is you know that super old like i wonder if that's you know kind of partially gives a bit of her a, a kind of the obscure sort of mysterious kind of nature of her of her realm as well kind of I guess gives that feeling of like ancient you're not sure what she wants and then uh, you know what i mean Which potentially if she was around before other spirits or something weird like that mm. perhaps that's why she wants to become everything it's like when the second sibling gets born and the first one gets jealous she's like i want it to be like it was before i want to be everything mm. i feel like that's why she's though like i just it's just the consistency of the term terminology i just think like Hermaeus Moras kind of gives the vibe that is really, really ancient, and so does Namira. But kind of putting Azura and you know potentially nocturnal like shadows and stuff. But Noct um, Azura doesn't seem kind of the same to me, I guess. Or like, and it, it just kind of makes me think that are all the Daedra, Erdra, like for that's the most, what I was thinking. As outside well, like of I, the ones it, that have been created, like in a Shake later or story, or, or Dagon or something. But like, you know what I mean. Mm. Yeah, I, I guess, like, you know, if I'm trying to rationalize it just off the top of my head, it's like when I'm thinking of these Erdra, it seems like they're, they're forces that were there very early. So, for example, um, you know, the beginning of time, you've kind of got Azura's passage of night and day. And then when you've got, like, the darkness and Nocturnal being an offshoot of the darkness. So she's like the shadow, the interplay of Anu and Padamai, the shadows against the light. Mm. Sorry, the darkness against the light, creating the shadows. If Nocturnal is, like, the patron of shadows then she's there pretty early. So, you know, as soon as you've got the the meshing of light and dark, she kind of is born off from that. So that's one yeah, reason. Right. And whereas like uh, Hermaeus Mora is left over from the creation of the Munda. So he's inherently is going to be there when it's created. So it's like, these are very early. Excuse whereas me. are you trying to say perhaps something like Clavicus Vile, which is very involved in packs and deals and mortal affairs may come later? Yeah, well, like the, there's nothing to say that these are kind of like, um, like a, a prince like Clavicus Vile or Sanguine, for example, they're not going to predate mortals. You know, they kind of, they rely upon mortals to have their spirit. Well, like obviously they do predate them because they're yeah, spirits who were there before the creation. But yeah, like what they kind of resemble isn't... I know yeah, what you're mortal, getting at. But that's yeah. that's literally just off the top of my head. So it could be a load of crap. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> the other, another question, this is an interesting one, actually. Um, Zach Kyla, why are the Twilight Sephulchre and Ebonmere portal so important to her influence? Other Daedric gods seem to be powerful enough without a portal to their plane, but Nocturnal needs a super secret crew to guard the portal to the Everglome, and closing the portal brings misfortune to her followers. It, my, my first guess would be that it is not so much about like this big influence thing. I think it might be a localized thing, like sort of to the Skyrim area of influence or so on i feel like and maybe it's kind of the intensity of influence that can come through versus uh elsewhere in the in the in Tamriel. well if you think about the fact that you've got you know wh however it came into being whether it was akatosh who did it with the the dragon fires and stuff the the whole idea is you've got a barrier between Nern and and uh oblivion 
Whereas having this, having a portal there permanently that can just connect Oblivion to the mortal realm is pretty powerful. And it kind of ties into mm. the skeleton key conversation we had too. Yeah. So, yeah. Seems important to protect and maintain. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's just sort of talking like they're, they're just the, the difference of influence though too. Like, and I, don't, I don't know if it necessarily is. I feel like I might be played up in the Skyrim thing a little bit. And that's why I was saying it might be localized in in terms of because 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 otherwise wouldn't all thieves all over Tamriel have bad luck? Yeah, no, like thieves, like the sphere just sort of hits everything. I think it's an intensity sort of thing, perhaps, or poor or it just writing. Wasn't, yeah, or it just wasn't <laughs> thought yeah. through. Um, best kill six eight says, does she have any connection to um, shadow magic? And yeah, she does. Like it's kind of like a natural association by the fact that she is you know, Queen of Shadows kind of thing. And then she made a shadow version of Sotha Sil. And sort of, it all plays on the similar idea of, of shadow magic that's in the Shadow Key game that's the sort of um, created by conflict of forces and stuff like that. And yeah, I, I like, it's kind of, you could probably even get like um, in some like Carl Jung kind of stuff with like the shadow self and, and things like that, that um, you could expand her sphere to a lot of things. So yeah. Um, Jay Cut says, "Is she down to smash? Probably not, man. <laughs> I feel, like, I feel like she's pretty. It's a trick. Yeah, there's it's a, a trick. There, there are a lot of questions and like that are just like, who is hotter in your opinion, Azura or Nocturnal, and things of this nature. Um, but yeah, there's just lots and lots of probably Nocturnal. Will Scott talk about Vor in this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> probably not this one." <laughs> But um, right. I think I think that pretty much covers the essence of Nocturnal. Um, but she's not a good person. Not a good person. <laughs> the way you say it makes her sound so mortal. And like you've been personally affected. Yeah. She's, she's not a good person. Disgusting behavior. Yeah, just, you know. I denounce Nocturnal. <laughs> <laughs> I publicly denounce. Now nah, she's really, really cool, but she's a she's a villainous I, I, character. I like Nocturnal. I yeah. think Nocturnal's super cool. One yeah. of the coolest Daedric princes there is. What? <laughs> <laughs> she's top seventeen for sure. No, yeah, no, I, no yeah. I, I like her. The artifacts yeah, are, cool. are super cool. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, there we go. Emo, big titty goth chick, <laughs> Daedric yeah. prince. That that's right. it. Okay, well, thanks everyone for watching. And our social media links are down in the description. We'll be back to nerd out with you all again. And stay tuned to our Twitter for what topics are coming next. See ya. See you later.